This is Pod Strangely Warm, a place where we tell the good Methodist story, where we have conversations that invite followers of Jesus to seek after that loving, just, and free world that God imagines for us all, and have a little fun along the way. Welcome to Pod Strangely Warmed. I'm Daniel Hawkins, your host, and today we continue in our preparation for General Conference. You've heard a lot about the three R's that are going to be considered at General Conference. You heard about the legislative priorities and from uh, our district superintendents last week, what our heart might need to be as we move into this season. Uh, today, for our 50th episode of Pod Strangely Warmed, right. woo woo! woo. Um, Ramon is not excited. Uh, <laughs> we we are pleased to welcome some fellow newbie delegates. Uh, as many of you know, this general conference is one we've been prepping for for half a decade now. It's uh, true. <laughs> and, and for those of us in 2019 who said yes to like, hey, put me up, let me be considered to be elected, we thought we would maybe be moving on to general conference number two at this point, mm-hmm. not number one. But today I'm incredibly excited to be joined by uh, Reverend Ramon Smith from Saginaw United Methodist Church and Shandon Klein, one of the lay delegates uh, from the North Texas Conference and and, and a woman with many titles and many different hats that she wears. She's a PhD student at SMU. We'll be getting commissioned as a provisional uh, elder elder, uh, at annual conference this year and currently serves at First Richardson. Mm -hmm. And so where they have a swanky podcast studio. (laughs) And so uh, we're Thankful that both of you are here. Uh, as glad to be here. Yes. Amen. Yeah. It is. It's. It's a good time. It, when this drops, we'll be one week out from the start of general conference. Sweat beads. Sweat beads. <laughs> right. Right. As we get started today, can you just take a couple of minutes and introduce yourself to our Pod Strangely Warm family and and share a little bit about who you are? And I asked each of you to bring something that represents you, right, or uh, is meaningful to you. Uh, so tell us who you are and, and a little bit about what you brought with you today. Shandon? Okay. Um, I'm Shandon Klein. Um, like I, like um, Daniel was saying, I have a variety of different roles. But, um, yeah, I brought, <laughs> I brought my keys because, one, I knew that uh, I'd remember to bring them. <laughs> fair. That's good. Yeah, that's but, smart. That's fair. That's why she's the PhD but, student. You know, yes, you'll have yes. to use use the brain here. Soon to be doctor. Um, yes. Um, but like he's actually are pretty representative of me because um, as many of my friends would say, I'm, I'm pretty driven when mm. it comes to things, especially things that I'm really passionate about. One of them being general conference in our United Methodist polity. Um, but also um, I am grounded by my husband. And um, this is a, um, a little keychain that he got for me. Um, it says S and S, Shane and Shandon. Okay. And then when you open it up, it's a wedding picture that we took. Aww. And it says drive safe. I need you here with me. Mm. And so that's one thing that I try to remember as I am driven, right. I try to do so <laughs> safely. Yeah. Um, Don't leave Shane in the in, dust. Right. right. Oh, okay. I was like, yeah. but also do it in an authentic ways. Yeah. And mm-hmm. So yeah, that's that's my little spiel, I guess. Very good. A little good. bit about me. Yeah. Yeah. What are you working on your doctorate in right now? Yeah, so my doctorate is going to be in religious ethics, okay. and um, I just got my. Um, my proposal for my dissertation approved, praise God, Oop. Um, which will be on looking at um, the concept of resistance and control and looking at the role of theology and cultivating that alongside with the ethical frameworks that um, undergird those things within the lives of political activists. Okay. So... It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I plan on doing an ethnography. So that um, involves doing participant observation. So being Mm. alongside the political activists and doing interviews and all of that. So super excited. Very cool. And so, yeah. Anybody who is over the age of 18 and considers themselves to be a political activist, I would want to hear their voice. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you for joining us today, yeah, and, and yeah. I'm glad to, to have a little bit of Shane's sweetness joining us Me today, know. too. Love uh, you, babe. I know. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> uh, Ramon, uh, give us a little introduction into to who you are and what you've brought with you here today. All right. So uh, I'm married, of course, to Gabrielle Smith, uh, and we've got two wonderful kids, uh, RJ and Isabel. RJ is 11. 
and he loves uh, soccer, and he's a great student. He's in the honors choir, wonderful kid. And uh, Isabel, she's eight. She's into dance. She's an excellent student, uh, loves artwork. And so I'm really enjoying being a dad mm. So yeah, and a husband. And oh. so um, I brought with me the Sumrail Smith Family Bible. And it means a lot to me because it was handed down uh, to my mother from my from my grandmother. And my grandmother actually received this Bible from her mother. So okay. this book was published in 1947. So, And it has our family history in it, written in it and everything. And uh, had it, uh, of course, it was in worse condition. And so I had it redone mm-hmm. and all that. Yes. But all the pages and all that, that it's maintained its integrity. It's just a cover yeah. that uh, has been redone. So... Um, it means a lot to me because it reminds me of my roots, where I come from. Yeah. And also, um, when I was a kid, uh, we had like this 15-minute uh, drive from our church uh, to home. And I was sitting in the back seat, and I would listen to my grandmother and my mother uh, critique the sermon uh, I would hear them basically exegete the scripture. Oh, cool. uh, mm-hmm. And so that is how I learned to ask questions of the text, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. how to reflect theologically. It was in those rides home. So, oh. uh, so cool. my grandmother was the first, and my, my mother, like non-academic theologians mm-hmm. um, that yeah. really mm-hmm. had like a profound influence on me. And so... That's why I have it here today, and it means yeah. a lot to me. That's and reminds me too, Scripture is primary. Yeah, beautiful. I love that. Right, and, and the the intersectionality mm-hmm. of family and faith and church yeah. and and who you are today. Right, mm-hmm. exactly. Um, your week by week work of, mm-hmm. of right. Sunday's always coming, and there's always a sermon to preach. But you also, you know, you are formed right by those car rides. Right. But you also remember that those car rides are happening, so you make sure and do your homework, too. (laughs) Right, right. Well, you know... Because your mom and grandma aren't the only one having those car rides. Right, Uh, right, exactly. And so it was really a uh, blessing to me to be able to just kind of sit there and take that in. And, like, later on, you know, when I I went to seminary and everything, I I came to realize that they were using uh, some of the same, like, uh, theological tools. They were using... Of course, scripture was primary, and then they were using reason. They were looking at their own experiences. Yeah, um, they were relying on like um, tradition, you know, and so like institutional memory and things like that uh, as they applied it to the text. So anyway, I learned a lot from that, and I realized that um, although they may not had may not have had the language, mm. they were doing the work. So it was like right. orthopraxy, yeah. right. right? Yes. So that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it speaks to when we talk about tradition, right? So often when we talk about tradition, we think about, well, what did John Wesley say about X, Y, or Z, right. or one, two, yeah. or three? Or we yeah. think about the work we're going to be doing with forming and shaping the foundational theological principles at General Conference and right. you know, what is in the book of discipline. But one of those places where tradition meets our lives is those who help shape and form our faith, right? Right, mm-hmm. exactly. Those, those non-public theologians, right, exactly. who we sit in cars with as they process the the sermon from Sunday, or we, right. you know, you know, I remember talking with my folks again and again, we'd experience a, a, a moment where I'm like, because we grew up in an environment where the kind of United Methodist approach was the um, kind of minority approach within the real pop religiosity of the community that we right. were in, right? right? And so we'd encounter something that was radically more fundamental or felt much more judgmental or, or whatever, and I... I'd sit in the car and go, now, how did we end up here? And w- w- help me understand what they're saying and how, the, you know, how do they come to that mm-hmm. conclusion mm-hmm. when it doesn't fit with anything I've ever heard on a Sunday morning, sure. right? And right, I felt right, within right. The, those places of formation. Thank you so much for, for bringing the family Bible. What a gift to be able to have that generationally. And you've made sure it's well-preserved so that when it's your turn to pass it hey man, to no your kids. Well, I, well, yeah. <laughs> No, that, that, like, that's good, feel good <laughs> weather there. Uh, no. But when things matter, that's what we yeah, do, right? We yeah, take good care yeah. of them, right? Yeah. Shannon, you mentioned as a part of your intro a real passion for United Methodist polity, right? Yeah. Which 
Uh, we we claim the fact that we are a Methodist nerd podcast, right? That most of the folks listening to this are good church nerds, laity and clergy mm. alike. But to say that you have a passion for Methodist polity yeah. places you on a whole nother level it's, yeah. uh, of Methodist nerddom. It's weird. Um, it's not weird. <laughs> it's cool, uh, and and I'm and I'm glad for it. Right? We've we've served alongside each other for a couple of years now on yeah. some jurisdictional matters, and mm. I am thankful for for that Methodist nerddom in those places. Um, as we continue to, I'd be curious, right? I don't know what the process was like in North Texas. Mm -hmm. In 2019 in Central Texas, we had a process by which we could say, I'm interested in being on the delegation, right? Mm -hmm. You put your name forward. Right. And then we had elections and annual conference, right. uh, kind of like normal. Mm -hmm. um, what led you, if there was a putting your name forward process, sure. what led you to say, I'm interested in serving in this way? Yes. Yeah, so um, that would be <laughs> when I was sitting um, watching the stream of the 2019 mm. special central, <laughs> this is about, yeah, special um, <laughs> conference. And it was um, I was in my first year of seminary. Um, and we uh, we had like kind of a watch party type of scenario yeah. in our um, in our little space. And we were looking up. And, um, you know, I had always been interested in, you know, annual conference when we actually host our annual conference, First Richardson typically does. And I always saw, found myself just enthralled with like the when they actually started talking about the resolutions. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of interesting and getting to see how the connectionalism actually works mm -hmm. and all of that. But I had never seen a general conference ever and so you know i'm, I'm experiencing so your first years. introduction was 19 yes my first god bless you my first uh. introduction was 2019 so um <laughs> um yeah. you know of course you know our um north texas conference was a one church plan conference right. and um you know that's you know what we were hoping for and um i just remember sitting there you know, as the, you know, as the traditional plan got passed and, you know, seeing the hurt and pain and all of that, but seeing the speeches afterwards mm. and just that spark, right? Like that you could see that there was a little spark underneath that, like that this wasn't done. Yeah. And I was just like, well, as long as that spark's still there, I think that I can still remain United Methodist and try to work towards, you know, reducing the harm. And, yeah. um, you know, through a lot of prayer. <laughs> sure. And a lot of things. I was just like, okay, I'll look at that because um, at least on the lay side, there's um, you have to be a member of the United Methodist Church for four years. Okay. And by God, quite literally... By the time it actually would have been like the deadline to do it, I would have been four years. Old. Okay. So just barely. Just was, barely. Okay. Maybe like by a few days. Okay. And I was just like, well, if I was just like, if I make the qualifications, then I'll put my name in. <laughs> and yeah. I did and uh, got elected. Um, and I'm, I'm very blessed to be with all of you guys. Um, just to be able to, because um, quite literally, there aren't that many you know people of color or mm. women of color who make the floor, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that's the reason why I, I waited the four years to get commissioned because okay. it it me makes a difference on having our voices heard, you know. Yeah. Well, and just for, for those who may not be familiar with the process, you were elected as a lay delegate, yes, right? Yes, as a lay delegate. Yeah. And But are you are pursuing ordination yes. uh, in the United Methodist Church. And so yes. if, you know, in 2020, if we'd had the conference I as planned, been, you would have right. been golden and fine. That's what I was um, thinking would happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't and, happen that way. <laughs> and so you've intentionally chosen so that you might participate fully yeah. in general conference mm -hmm. to delay your process toward ordination yes. in the United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. Um that's how much this means to you. I, I, I didn't want I, yeah. I didn't want that to kind of no, slip by, right? Sure, this is yeah. a, a meaningful uh expression. And in in some ways, when we hear what uh, you know, what you're doing your doctoral work in, right? Where your passions intersect, Obviously, right? Yeah. Theology and ethics and the political beast that is a human experience, right? right. And activism within the midst of that. And, right. you know, uh, there's political activity anywhere there are humans, right? Whether right. it's formal, official, or informal and, and unofficial. Mm -hmm. um, 
to see where those things come together. General mm-hmm. Conference is one of those places where they come together in right. the life of our Methodist experience and it expression. Does. So, yeah. um, and our policy, I mean, one thing that I like continue to remind people, these policies aren't just words. They, they affect people, you yeah. know, like, and they affect the way that we, you know, if some people connect with God and mm. whether people think that they can connect to God. Right. So we really yeah. have to be, um, really intentional about our policies to make sure that everybody is welcome at our table that we say that we are. Are we truly an open table or are our policies making it a more constricted one? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Ramon, you, you nodded a minute ago uh, when Shannon said it was while watching 2019. Yeah. That she, was... she made the decision to to put her name forward or to mm-hmm. pursue this. Um, tell me a little bit about what made so, you say yes. So I'll start with the, the there was a spark there. Uh, we had watch party, uh, a watch party going on at the church I was serving at the mm-hmm. time. And there was, I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but there's this dude named Sergey that kept coming to the <laughs> mic. You, remember, yes. you guys yes. remember Sergey? Yes. I was like, if that guy can do it, no. Right. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Mine was JJ's. JJ Warren's yeah. speech just yeah. broke me open. Just, if, if you were watching oh, uh, General Conference, God. Sergey and JJ represented <laughs> polar opposite <laughs> yes. expressions right. Right. of participation. Yes. Patient yes. in the process, but True. right, and, and like everybody in between, and right. so, so anyway, uh, I want to start with the why, if you don't yeah. mind. So, I love the United Methodist Church, yeah. and it, as I look over my life, uh, I see all the ways in which the United Methodist Church has shaped and formed uh, who I am today. So, uh, starting at uh, Seven Springs United Methodist Church, and those folks there. Uh, recognizing that I had a call on my life, and never forget our Sunday school superintendent, Mr. McGee, saying that boy's going to be a preacher one day. He's going to be a pastor one day. And then having the awesome opportunity to go to Gulfside Assembly Center in Waveland, Mississippi, which is a historical place for African Americans who are United Methodists, because that is where we used to gather uh, in order to have our conference uh, prior to. Yeah. Prior to 19, what, 68? Yeah. Yeah. And the merger with the EUB. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a place where we could truly be free and everything like Mm -hmm. that and fellowship with one another. Well, while I'm there at this camp, I'm like either 10, somewhere between 10 and 12 years old. Uh, There is a pastor uh, from the Central Texas Conference who's Mm -hmm. there. Now, keep in mind, I'm originally from Mississippi. This is happening in Mississippi, Luther Felder is leading the chapel time, and he stops in the middle of his message, and he points to, like, three of us, and he's like, you, 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 you're going to be pastors one day. And, like, he, when he said that, I mean, I already knew it, right? Mm-hmm. I felt it deep in my soul. So then I go on to, uh, I go on to college, and uh, I was able to benefit from the Board of Higher Education Scholarships Mm -hmm. to help support me in my secular undergraduate degree, right? Degrees, plural. And then, uh, again, support uh, from my local congregation and from United Methodist Church as I pursue my calling and and going to seminary. And in seminary, my first semester, I meet my wife, Mm -hmm. who was in a law school at SMU. And so, like... (laughs) And then the blessings that I've experienced from all the lay people um, that I've had the privilege of serving through ministry. And so I love the United Methodist Church because the United Methodist Church has truly touched my life in so many different ways. And so it's out of love for the church that I wanted, I felt this strong desire to um, put my name forward. Because as I was sitting there in 2019 and I was watching, and like you say, there was some there's some hurt, yeah. a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. But I also sensed that God was up to something mm-hmm. and that uh, I wanted to be a part of this new thing mm-hmm. that God was going to do. Yeah. And yep. so there was a lot of support at the church where I was serving at the time. They were like, yes, you should do this. And I, I spoke with my wife and prayed about it. And, and you know, we, we had our process in a Central sure. Texas yep. conference. Mm-hmm. And and here I am today. I'm, I'm serving as a, a second alternate uh, on the delegation. So that is why. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, 
I don't know that I had articulated that clearly the beginnings of my love for the United Methodist Church, but our stories, I think, have some radical similarity on that front, right? It is one of those communities of people who have been with me at every mm-hmm. step of life and mm-hmm. every step along the way. And, and in 2019, in the midst of the hurt and the harm and the trouble that came there, right? Um, because whether or not you agree with the passage of the traditional plan or not, the way we we came to, the way we dealt with each other right. at General Conference in right. 2019, there was pay, pain and hurt and harm in the midst of that, right? Yeah. And right. so the heart, my heart broke uh, for my, for the church that it had helped shape and form me, right? Mm. Right. And, and, and so part of the call was to say, how can we help be a part of the, the future of this thing, right? How can right. we help uh, usher in? Because God was, you know, it did feel like God was up to something. Yeah, yeah right? and absolutely. It was like in right. the midst of that, there was like yeah. this, like, this spark, and you could feel you it. Could that feel like it. God is up to something, There's even in the something. midst of all this hurt. Absolutely, and that that God is going to do this new thing. And like I said, yeah, you saw it. Yeah, like, it was it's so ama- visible. It was amazing that yeah, you and I both were sitting there watching it. Yeah, yeah, and and <laughs> on and the little like, big screen, or, right? Because like, because realistically, you know, like I'm sitting there, I'm in my first year of seminary, right. and I'm just like, well. It, you know, like I didn't even know all of these things were going on in the Methodist Church. Mm. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, you no, didn't have like, the, I didn't, we've been I didn't fighting have the, on this no, for 50 no, years. No, I did not history. have any of that okay. stuff, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I didn't have none of that history. And yeah. I'm like, I'm looking at some of these. I'm like, ooh, ooh, there's there's some ooh, some drama here. Like, um, it is the United Methodist Church something that I'd want to stick with? I was on, yeah. I, I was on staff at First Richardson as a assistant director of welcoming. So, like, for me, like, you know, it's like what what delineates being a United Methodist be- between being like an Episcopalian or a Catholic and all that. Those are things that I always had questions on, yeah. you know, like and it, one of the things that, you know, I had learned it was about, you know, the connectionalism and everybody working together and just this special session did not reflect that. Mm-hmm. Right. And so um, but. That said, you also saw the other side of the coin where you did start to see it. You saw people starting to gather together and to regroup and yeah. um, and all of that. I'm like, it, it's so hard to explain, but yeah, that spark was just so, mm-hmm. so present. And you just felt that there was something there. I'm like, oh, no, there, there's still something there. There yeah. might be this Good Friday here. Right. But yeah. like but there, so, there's now. something coming. Sunday's coming. Sunday's on the horizon now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I think these moments of our connectionalism, they're they're so deeply embedded in our DNA. They're so you know, it's it's who we are, right? Yeah. We are not independent people. We are right. connectional, connected people. And yet that connectionalism can bring forth both the beauty and the brokenness. Right. right? Exactly. It, it can have moments that are our highest of highs, but also mm. Uh, some of those lowest of lows, right? right? Some of those moments where we feel like, man, we did not live into the promise right. that 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 we felt like we had together mm-hmm. in, in that moment. And, mm-hmm. and so um, as we move into General Conference, right, as we record this, we're two weeks out. Uh, mm-hmm. When when this drops, we'll be one week from, like, opening day yeah. of General Conference. Yeah, that make uh, it sound like baseball, right? It, it, right yeah. You know, Woo! <laughs> And just remember, as we said last week on the podcast, with the three R's, it is baseball. One for three is progress. It's not perfect, but it's progress. When we think about this opening uh, of General Conference, as we get close, right, we've joked before the the mics were on about some pieces of advice that we were given to prep mm-hmm. ourselves as new people, right? Mm-hmm. Make sure you got good shoes. Make sure you bring yeah. your pillow. Make sure, yeah. you know, those mm-hmm. kinds of, of, you know, have a good water bottle, all that kind of stuff, right? Um as new folks who share a, a sparking moment that made you say yes to this work to begin with, I'm curious, as you come in, what what are some, some baseline hopes that you have uh, for General Conference, whether it's specific legislative priorities or just general spirit? You know, for, for me, my... One of my profound hopes is that the the spirit looks much more like we experienced at jurisdictional yes. conference yeah. than we experienced at 2019's general conference, right? Because if the spirit and the vibe is that unified, mm-hmm. we're pulling forward, God's doing a new thing, even if we're imperfect in the execution, mm-hmm. right? You've got a sense that we're moving in the in the in the in a way that follows the spirit and in a way that 
there there is hope, not just Pollyanna optimism. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, and, absolutely. And so, uh, as you guys prep uh, for general conference, as you've been, you know, five years after uh, the moment where you said yes yeah. to pursuing this as a concept, what kind of hopes do you guys have yeah. as we start general conference, Shannon? Yeah. Um Oh, like outside of the three R's passing. Um, one of the things that I truly hope for is that there is holy conferencing mm. that we don't just say that it's holy conferencing right. just because like, Oh, Jesus is in the room, but actually um, show that manifest that embody that within our, in our committees mm. and out on the floor. And I think that we're positioned, especially there are, I, there's got to be a record breaking number of new delegates that mm. were elected to this. Yeah. And we have the opportunity to change the way that it feels in the room, mm. like to, to make these more conversations versus like debates, you know? Um, but yeah, just to, that everybody feels heard regardless of what side of the theological spectrum that they're on. Um, that all of our central conference delegates feel like they can voice themselves in their mother tongue mm. and not feel like they're bound to English, <laughs> you know, to be yeah. able to have our translators be able to do their thing so that we can have this holy Pentecost conversation <laughs> That looks like, um, like you know, the what we had in the South Central jurisdiction, right? Yeah. That's my hope, at least. <laughs> if Pentecost and and General Conference come together, uh, that's only a Holy Spirit thing, it, right? It, uh, but I mean, but if it also, happened in the South Central it, jurisdiction, right. I'm just like, listen, it felt like Pentecost, yeah. you know, like we no. when we when we broke out in song in the doxology mm. when we passed, you know, all three bishops. Yeah. Like that, I like, I want those moments. Like yeah. I think, and I f like for our global church, I feel like we need that moment okay. right now, yeah. you know, like, yeah. and so, you know, any way that we can facilitate that in ways that are respectful, respectful people. <laughs> Yeah. And um, I, I think that that that's at least what's on my heart and mind yeah. as I walk into general conference, at least. Amen. Mm. Ramon, how about you? I would say that I, I love the way you uh, uh, use scripture in terms of Pentecost and that experience. And, and, you know, I was there at jurisdictional conference and I felt it, too. Mm -hmm. So in terms of an outcome, uh, I am hopeful that we will deal with the issues that we seem to have been struggling with all these many years. Mm -hmm. And then that we would see what happened following Pentecost mm -hmm. in Scripture. That part. Uh, so, like, that we will see revival break out in our churches. Yes. That we will see people uh, baptized and that people experience the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so that that enthusiasm, that movement of the Holy Spirit we experience together, that we're hopeful to experience together, that it will spread. Yes. So let's kind of look at the reality of where we are right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. The United Methodist Church, along with pretty much all the mainline, traditional mainline uh, churches, were in decline prior to the disaffiliation. Correct. Right. right. And so Correct. now we, on top of that, we've lost 25 percent of our churches due to disaffiliation, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, we're at a place where um, the ch numbers are down, but our why can't mm. be yes. about increasing Absolutely. the numbers and putting butts in seats. Absolutely. We've got to get really clear right. about our mission. Yes. Right. And about spreading that, that holiness yeah. socially in yes. terms of also in terms of our uh, our, our hearts as well, mm -hmm. we've got a compelling message. Our theology is wonderful, yeah. mm -hmm. but I think we have to equip our laity yes. in order to be able to share yes. uh, who we are yeah. mm -hmm. and do it in a way that's uh, authentic to each yeah. person, right? Absolutely. It's, it's not just like do these steps, mm -hmm. right? Right. Because here's the thing. So if we look historically, for example, when the church had a schism, 
So we, the church had a schism. Uh, I believe it was in the 1840s, uh, and it was over the issue of slavery. And so you had the creation of the Methodist Episcopal Church South, right? Mm-hmm. And so then once you had the Civil War and you had the emancipation of the slaves, the Methodist Episcopal Church did something really wise. What they did was they created the Mississippi-Louisiana Mission, mm. okay? And its sole purpose was to plant churches because they knew that all these newly freed mm-hmm. slaves would need somewhere to worship. They were interested in spreading uh, uh, the uh, message of the, uni- uh, of the Methodist Church to those who had been uh, newly freed. Yeah. Now, if you look at a map, You'll see that starting in Mississippi, you and you see all the dots of churches that started, and then you see, you'll see Louisiana, and then by the time you move out west to Texas, uh, there are fewer dots. But here's the thing I want to point out: my home church, mm. Seven Springs United Methodist Church, got started as a result of that. Mm. I'm United Methodist today because mm. of that mission. Mm. Mm. Here's my point. We can do all these things legislatively. Absolutely, yeah. And if we do not have a clear plan correct, to mm. reach those folks that have been excluded, that part. Yep. then we're going to continue to be a church in decline. Mm. And Absolutely. many people are going to miss out on the blessings that our expression of Methodism has to offer. Yeah. Absolutely. As you're sharing and, and telling us the story of the Louisiana Mississippi mission, yeah, I'm reminded if we keep going to Acts four, right? Mm-hmm. Post Pentecost, the the apostles are doing their thing, they're drawing attention, they get in trouble, right? Yeah. With the Sanhedrin. They they get called in, they get you know, things go poorly for a hot second. They get set free and they have this this micro Pentecost moment second, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Where the Holy Spirit comes and empowers and, and I'm drawn to their prayer. Because in that moment, their prayer is not free us from affliction. Right. Their prayer is not make all this trouble go away. Their prayer is Holy Spirit, come and give us the courage well, to be your ambassadors. Come mm-hmm. on, preachers. Right? Yes. Um, I think that's where we are, right? Help us, Spirit, clarify the way forward yeah. and give us courage to be clear on who we are Absolutely. and clear on where we are going yeah. forward mm-hmm. because we don't know who... Who generational Ramon will be? Right, that's, that's oh, the point. exactly. That, that's yeah. the point right there. And whose family Bible? Yeah, whose right. family Bible on, on a different table, yeah, right. yeah, different exactly. Set at some yeah. other time. Yeah, whose grandmama or or yeah. mother or paternal figure? Right. Yeah. yeah. Help shape and form their faith because they found welcome in a church that they weren't sure that they were going to be welcome in. Right. Yeah. Until clarity came. And and, yeah. and and that's the point. We've got to do yeah. that 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 second part. We can do all the things legislatively. But we still got to be it's about the mission of the church yes. and reaching. Because here's my concern. My concern is that even in many settings today, we, we added the language of, of witness, right, mm-hmm. to, our, right. Yeah. to sure. our vows, right? But if you were to poll many of our members and you ask them, what is witness? No. <laughs> right. Yep. So we, we haven't yep. done our job in terms of... Uh, a, you know, as a denomination, I think. I agree. Yeah. Uh, some I agree. have done a better job than others. Right. But overall, in educating our people on the importance of witnessing and why that's in, important to share our Wesleyan emphasis of mm. grace right. yeah. and what that looks like, right? Yeah, absolutely. That is my, that's my hope. Um, the outcome mm-hmm. that, that, yeah, we, we take general care of things. General conference means general conference. Yeah, right? yeah legislatively. Yeah. But then, we still have work to do. And then, it does not end there. And then when we leave there, <laughs> yeah. the yeah. work the work continues. Absolutely. The bishop might say that we might be followers of Jesus seeking after the loving, just, and free world that God imagines for all people. Amen. Yes, Amen. that part. All tongue-in-cheek aside, I incredibly appreciate the clarity that that the bishop and Philip and others have been trying to give to us, to point us to that direction forward, to say... What does the future look like, right? It is that, right? can we imagine a loving, just, and free world? Mm -hmm. The same loving, just, and free world that God imagines for all people. Mm -hmm. And once we imagine it, let's get moving in that direction, right? Make it tangible. Right. I think that if, going back to what you were saying earlier, if we're truly this welcoming church where everybody has a a place, um, everybody has a place at the table, well, 
we live in a world where people feel more and more isolated. People have right. fewer friends. Right. You know, yeah. people spend more and more time on their phones, you know, yeah. doom scrolling. And the church, one of the things that the church, when it's at its best does, is a place for community building. Right. And so I think we, we have this incredible gift that we can share with the world. And it's just like helping. It's almost like many of our congregations need a pep talk. Yes. <laughs> like, you're yeah. great. You're yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And by golly, people yeah. like you. you right. Right. There you go. Well, even so, like, I look at general conference because, you know, if we're using the table language and be like, this is like, so, you know, we, we say we have an open table, right? You can have an open table with all chairs around it. But um, like and you can even set it real nice and pretty. We can set up all of these policies to be nice, pretty for ready to go. But um, there still needs to be food put on the table. There needs to be conversations. I can be at an open table. I like that. Without anybody talking to me. Come on. And so like like so, for example, we have, you know, the Charter for Racial Justice is another resolution that is coming to be re-upped. And the Charter for Racial Justice, obviously, it's on my heart because I'm a United Women in Faith, you know, like all of that. But and it's got some really wonderful things in it. But again, if we don't look at it, if we don't actually execute this in our world, like it's just if it's another, not embodied. It's, it's not embodied. It's, it's a piece of paper. Right. You know, it, like it, it's the practical part of right. it. It's the working out yes. in real life every day. Yeah. And it just kind of takes me back again to like my my grandmother, and my and my mom, in, in the car, and them like that was very practical. Right. It's real world you working it, it out, make it making plain. it plain. And I and I think that. You know, we have to figure out ways in which to communicate this thing. This is one last thing I want to say about all this is that I think it's really, really, really important that people understand that our beliefs, our doctrine, those things are not changing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 I think that's yep. when we, whatever <laughs> happens yes. at general conference. That's the message everybody needs to hear. Yes. The theological foundation the, and theological core yes. Yes. is yes. Yeah. the essentials are core. The essentials are yeah. essential. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Ramon, thank you so much mm-hmm. for being with us. Shandon, thank you mm-hmm. so much for being with us. And thank you so much for sharing your heart, your hopes, and and your why for doing this work here at General Conference. I'm hopeful that in the midst of our time during General Conference, we can have a check-in along the way and and see your experience of this reality as we move from five years of preparation Mm -hmm. to five days in or eight days in of actually doing the work Mm -hmm. that, again, won't matter unless we embody it later on. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for joining us today on Pod Strangely Warm. Until next time, I'm Daniel Hawkins. This has been Pod Strangely Warm. If you enjoyed our conversation today, know that you can find us anywhere you find podcasts. On Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, any and all the places, we are there. So if you want to continue the good United Methodist conversation that you've been a part of today, find us, like us, rate us, review us, and share with a friend so that the good news that is happening right here in our own midst can amplify even 